So I just want to thank everyone for attending this Hobart William Smith speaker series tonight. And I am very happy to have Ben Ristel and Eric Herman here to present on craft knowledge and the art of DIY science outreach. And I will turn it over to both Ben and Eric and I will slowly disappear from this and reappear later. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Alexis. Sure. Um, Thank you. So we'll hopefully get to see Alexis soon, but we wanted to start, uh, Eric and I, uh, with thanking the Wood Library in Canandaigua and especially Alexis Lawrence, who you have now seen, um, who has helped us set up this webinar. Um, I also wanna thank Dr. Mark Deutschlander, uh, who has been in charge of this series, speaking series as well. Um, lucky enough for you, um, he will be giving a presentation next month, uh, April 21st. I believe that'll be at the seven o'clock time, but don't quote me on that. So April 21st, um, and the title of his talk is Birds in Our Landscape, Tracking Spring Migration. So for all of you birders or ornithologists out there, DIY birders, um, feel free to drop in on uh, Dr. Deutschlander's uh, presentation next month, April 21st. So we're gonna start by doing some brief introductions. I'll do an introduction to myself and then uh, turn it over to Eric. And, and then I'll talk a little bit about the framework for our conversation. So you can have some sense of where we'll be headed in this conversation for the next hour. Um, but I wanna start by just saying I'm uh, Ben Risto. I'm an associate professor at Hobart and William Smith Colleges um, in Geneva, New York. I work in the writing and rhetoric department there. Uh, my current project, a book project that I'm working on, is called Craft Consciousness and Artistic Practice in Creative Writing. And as part of this research, um, I've been lucky enough to um, interview an international group of artists um, and ask them about what they understand the term craft to mean. Uh, so that's part of what I want to sort of plant as a seed in our conversation tonight, which is what does craft mean or how does craft constituted uh, within our lives or within our understanding? And in the book project that I'm working on, um, I define craft as something that happens within inside us. So something of a kind of internal awareness, um, something that's akin to the exploratory and the experiential as, to, as opposed to something that's more like technique um, or how to the things we read in manuals. Um, so as part of that, I got to interview Eric Herman, who is a neighbor, uh, friend, I would say an artist and DIY scientist. Um, and he has um, really enlivened me to the idea of experiential education and how that maps on to science and especially physics. So with that, I'll turn it over to him um, and he'll give his introduction. All right, thanks, Ben. So, uh, so I'm Eric Herman and uh, I've loved tinkering with things since I was a kid, whether it's playing with a lens or, you know, watching spinning gears in a clock or something, shocking myself. Um, but uh, but I, I discovered early on, uh, I went to school, uh, like I'm sure a lot of you did, this, this kind of uh, disparate, uh, this difference between the academic world and the after school world um, that continued through college. Um, in college, uh, I, I've, I've always found a way to, to, uh, to get my fill of both of those worlds and even try to join them. Um, and, and the physics fun night was in college. Uh, they offered this thing for the public. I was building physics demonstrations. Um, so that's how I got my fix there. Meanwhile, I was studying philosophy, physics, music, and ultimately getting my um, certification to teach physics, um, ultimately a master's of science teaching. Um, but as a middle school, high school teacher, the same thing started happening. I was feeling that there were these two worlds and, uh, and what ended up happening after school um, was really exciting. Um, I eventually discovered community science workshops, um, of which we'll tell you more about in a little while, uh, of which free science where we are here tonight is one of those community science workshops um but uh but another thing these this physics fun night stuff i had been doing in college um eventually this overgrown hobby turned into the physics bus and we'll talk more about that but it's a uh, physics demonstrations exhibits aboard the physics bus. Um, so I helped found both of those, which are now their own nonprofits now at this point, 
and um, and I still hold on to the uh, the academic piece, still joining these worlds from both ends um, as a, a teacher up at Cornell University, um, physics teaching, and also another course uh, where students are building the exhibits that go aboard the physics bus. So that's my story, how I got to now. Wonderful. So we wanted to give folks a sense of kind of the traditional trajectory of our conversation um, this evening so that you have some sense of where we're headed. Um, you know a little bit, bit of background and you'll probably find out more through our conversations um, uh, tonight. Uh, but we wanted to really give you a sense that we would like this to be participatory and interactive as much as possible. Um, we are at the site of the Free Science Workshop um, which is a very much an interactive site. If you look behind Eric's head, you can see the instruments and materials uh, that are taking on a life of their own. Um, and we really would like audience participation, especially in the second half of this conversation. What will you participate on? Well, a couple of things are worth thinking about, which is we'll be talking about the concept of craft. We'll talk about DIY science. We'll be talking about repurposing uh, craft traditions. And there'll be a host of other kind of topics that you'll see flying around in our conversation. So from that, we wanted to pose at least three questions to you to start out with. We won't be answering these questions right now, but we'd like them to really be planted for you to think about um, through our conversation. And we'd like to return to these questions or other questions that you have in the second half of our conversation. So Eric and I are going to chat um, and give you some sense of where we kind of frame our considerations around craft and science. Um, but we would really love your participation in the second half. So in the chat, you'll notice I have a couple of questions there, maybe more like a few um, that you can look at. And I'd like you to kind of think about and circulate through your mind um, as we kind of return to them in the second half. You may have other questions that come up when you get to see the wonderful videos um, that Eric has composed for the physics bus and the free science workshop. So plan A or plan number one is that we are going to go through um, and show you a little bit more about the physics bus, the free science workshop. I'm gonna ask some follow-up questions of Eric and I hope Eric volleys some back to me so that we can begin a conversation in and around uh, what we mean by these terms like craft and, and science but also um, so that you can begin to think about how you want to participate in this conversation. And you'll be able to, to do that through the chat or through the audio uh, by raising your hand. Um, so with that, um, I think we will roll into the videos if you want to start with the physics bus video. Is there any context you want to give for this at all, Eric? Um, sure, yes. I, so this was a few years ago, maybe four years ago now that, uh, that I created this video. Um, I was at the time working at the synchrotron up at Cornell as the science outreach guy. My job was to, as much as possible, get scientists communicating directly to, um, to even K through 12 audiences, but also the general public. And the physics bus was a great way uh, to create a space in which all of the above, the, the K-12 and the scientists could share a common space that that was a third space, I think it it's sometimes called. Um, so yeah, I will uh, cue that up right now and share my screen. And share sound, here we go. There's a new way to experience reality, and it's definitely not virtual. Hi, I'm Eric Herman, Science Outreach Specialist at Cornell. I'm also one of the co-founders of the not-for-profit Physics Factory. For over 10 years, we've been igniting interest and engagement in physical science. Lately, more than ever, we've been doing it aboard a physics bus. That's right, we've been piloting a new platform for science. It's an exhibition on wheels, and it's based in New York. It did over 50 events in the past year. Schools, parks, community centers, boys and girls clubs, camps. More than 7,500 people got to experience creations that highlight physics phenomena. Totally new to them. This stuff is refreshingly familiar. Household appliances and recyclables. Having lost their intended purpose, these things have been reimagined, now with an even greater cause. 
In an increasingly digital world, our special effects are all natural and even better, they can be done with things you probably got at home. I see people's eyes light up, their jaws drop open, and they emerge from a bus with a totally new perspective on the things around them. It's obvious from the growing public interest that we've hit a trifecta for informal science. The playful environment, the stuff in it, that it rolls to where you are, there's clearly a need for more of it. Thanks to pioneers like Little Shop of Physics, Community Science Workshops, and Science Toymaker, the groundwork has already been paved for creating impressive but easy to make exhibits for kids to enjoy. X-Rays Cornell continues to play a key role in facilitating the design and construction of these exhibits. And its interest in promoting the exhibition on wheels is already helping us spread our reach. In the past year, we've even started a physics bus in Gainesville, Florida, and the folks there are quite excited. Now we're on a mission to spread the model far and wide. This winter, we'll be headed west to start another one in Tucson, Arizona. We believe that people deserve more opportunities for positive experiences in physics. The physics bus offers an excellent platform for providing that. We strongly encourage you to start a mobile science in your community. To learn more, hop on board and check out the physics bus when it rolls through your town. All right. There you go. <laughs> Wonderful. So the physics bus is one of the projects that Eric Herman um, is working on. And this is a traveling bus. It is doing demos for this summer. Um, but we want to talk a little bit about that. But I want to also set this next to another one of his projects, the projects we're sort of surrounded with right now, which is a community science workshop, which he's calling the free science workshop. Um, there's a video for that, and this is a little longer video of about five minutes. Um, but from this video and, and talking about the physics bus and the free science workshop, from this video, we're going to have a conversation or, or uh, kind of breakout between the two of us to begin to talk a little bit about some of the ideas um, that came to Eric to sort of start these projects um, and where they're going. So do you want to roll the next video? All righty, here goes. Share. And... I think when a kid walks in, their first thought is, holy cow, what's this place all about? If any kid walks in the door, chances are they're going to see something, and boom, you can see the spark in their eye. Asking questions, making observations are all a higher level of what's natural for humans to do in the first place. I like the work of the kids see them be happy about the things they have created themselves. As soon as I came in, I just sensed a spirit of creativity and energy, and I, I'm thinking, boom, this place is magical for children. We sometimes think of science as things that happens in a classroom or in a laboratory. Actually, science is something that can be part of an everyday healthy way of being. For us, science is more about a way to be connected to the world, and there's also this side of it that's creative. If you have an idea, this is a space where you can come and you can bring your ideas to life. There's liberty to be creative, to be imaginative, to discover, to explore, to experiment. When I first heard about the science workshop movement, I was just amazed that there could be a space where you could have, you know, both tadpoles that you're looking at under the microscope um, and power tools. We try to meet people where they are. And so if a kid doesn't really want to look at the bearded dragon, they don't have to. If they don't want to build a circuit, they don't have to. And I think that's really important for kids to feel like it's, it's all up to them. A lot of our stuff isn't what you typically see in a science laboratory or a classroom. The difference with science workshops is that these materials are just out. So they're open, they, they'll approach this object and they'll just start asking questions. And suddenly their knowledge is forming and they understand how their previous experiences in the world are relevant. We have a wood shop with a wide range of power tools. We have a whole lot of take-apart electronics. We have some turtles, we have a bearded dragon, we have two snakes. Kids like animals and they get to help create their environments and be right in front of the animals and feel and smell and hear them. We try to provide the supplies and provide the environment for kids to do whatever they can dream of. 
there is a huge disparity still between the haves and, and the have-nots. What we have here is a grassroots effort. We're really trying to remove as many barriers as possible. Children who may not be academically the superstars can have such a creative imagination that in a place like this, they can thrive. And that becomes a measure of not so much how smart are you, but how are you smart? We are located in an area that's a lot of low-income housing, and we have a lot of people that just walk to the space. They're gonna see friends, they're gonna see people with a similar background, and they're gonna feel like it's a space where they belong and where they can develop as a person. So we're called Free Science um, partly because kids are free to be authors of their own education, but we're also free because we don't charge admission. Um, participants can just walk in and there's no membership fees, no entry fee. Everyone can be a scientist and everyone should have the equal opportunity to access science. One of my favorite projects was working um, with a group of kids to make a vending machine. The kids had to identify problems as they came up and come up with ways to solve them. And they pushed through and they had this moment at the end when they were showing it off and they were so proud. There's a young boy who is building an exact replica of Paul McCartney's bass guitar. All these engineering skills are coming out of this project of his. That sort of drive is something that you just want to like capture and keep going. One of the boys decided that he wanted to make a boat and we talked about how it's possible to make a boat out of cardboard. So there's a lot of excitement around, you know, whether or not this is going to float. It was so exciting to put it in the water and see all that hard work come together. I can imagine that there are children who will come in here and discover some things about themselves and their interests that literally can be life-changing in terms of how they think about themselves as a learner. Not a lot of places, you know, you get to have your child use a power tool or your child gets to um, hold a snake, doing things that might look dangerous or might look messy, but that's how kids learn and get really excited about different things they might not have known they were excited about by experiencing it with all their senses opportunities like this that create those types of, of, of experience for young people are one of the best investments that we can make because we're really talking about things that can ultimately uh, be transformative in the life of a child. All right. It, it gets me every time. <laughs> it gets me every time. I've, I've only seen it a couple times and I'm I'm sure the uh, attendees and all the folks in the audience felt that too. Um, and I want to return to them and some of their thoughts, but at least for you and I, I'd love to have a conversation for about 10 minutes, especially since um, there's so many things that are initiated within both of these videos that I have questions about uh, in respects to, there's a million of them, but I'll start with one, which is what do you feel is, and I hope you'll volley questions back to me if you want, um, what did you feel, you mentioned this notion of a third space, a third space, which maybe is not the home, not the classroom, but this other kind of magical place where is part experimental, part exploratory, and you called it a third space. And one of the, um, one of the speakers in the video said capturing energy, right? It makes me think of those physics terms. I wonder if you could talk about how you identify this third space. How do you describe it to folks that are in the seminar here listening to us about what, what, is it, what is it trying to do and why did you see it as a, a need for kids? Yeah, so I, I first heard the terminology used in a, in a graduate class when I was studying, uh, studying education at the University of Arizona. But what, what, why it stuck with me, I think, is that, uh, is that when you get the notion in your mind, uh, you can start seeing it in, in all kinds of places. So it doesn't need to be strictly an academic uh, uh, situation. So I think, uh, so just to kind of give you guys an idea, um, uh, a third space in, in the context of what we're doing with the physics bus, um, the culture and the way people talk up at Cornell in the physics department is very different than the culture of the playground at, at an elementary school. And if you can create 
a space where both of those people feel comfortable because I'm sure you all would agree that uh, that the elementary kids in the context of the physics department would feel a little bit weirded out and I think the opposite is true too um, so so these third spaces uh, are just places where everyone can can feel comfortable. I think in our own lives, um, it might be even something you could relate uh, to to your family. Maybe the vibe if you go to Thanksgiving at one person's house versus another, or versus a third space. Go camping in the woods. Uh, now everybody's in a new place, and the dynamics are going to be different than than uh, than what it would be uh, in in certain spaces. So I think the the important takeaway is that is that the spaces you're in can have a big impact on who's going to feel comfortable expressing themselves in that space so you do you really feel like the space actually changes the psychology so like you were describing if we you know um, walk kids into the physics department at cornell that that may they may feel intimidated by the signage or the space in some capacity but in this i don't know if anybody will be able to see this space this space is crazy right there's a lot going on in respects to all the different things that are sort of hanging out and around here so this space that you're describing is a space of, it's got a lot of chaos in it though, isn't it? Is it? Is that part of the, the formula that you feel is really essential? Is, or is it chaos and energy and enthusiasm and what, what, what goes into the recipe that you feel fundamentally changes how somebody experiences the psychology of the space? Um. Yeah, so I just looked up something quick if you saw my eye move. It's um, <laughs> Alison Gopnik is an author who wrote a book called The Gardener and the Carpenter. And uh, I don't know if her background is in psychology or sociology, but it captures it really well. Um, she, um, she did a podcast with Hidden Brain um, where she talked about uh, teaching or, or parenting, I think, in, in uh, a more, uh, in a different, you know, of course, those are those overlap uh, in some places, but um, the idea is to create a garden, not a workshop um, in a teaching scenario, in a, in a parenting scenario, is that you're trying to cultivate something that you aren't forcing as you would in a wood shop. You're forcing something to be a certain way with these straight edges and stuck together and the visions in your mind of what, what you're gonna create, where, where the type of atmosphere we want here at the Free Science workshop is more like a garden where we set the conditions for growth, but we actually don't know what's going to spring forth. And that's part of the adventure. And I think the kids know that and the feeling, of, you know, when they see everything all over the place and we, we try to keep it pretty organized, but, um, and they see the, the wacky contraptions in that space, they, th their minds just are, are given permission to dream and build uh, uh, to their heart's content. It, it makes me think of uh, actually a woodworker by the name of David Pye, um, who I think is in the UK, who's, who's write, written some wonderful books, but sets up this dichotomy between uh, the idea of a workmanship of certainty where you know the outcome, and I think that's what you're describing the workshop to be, you know the outcome, and this is how industrial products are made, right? We, we want the Kleenex to be made a certain way that is repeatable and formulaic so that it's consistent. And he juxtaposes that with this idea of a workmanship, and we could say a work personship of risk. That risk is this other way of kind of operating within an exploratory terms in and around him for woodworking, but art making. And so it sounds like what you're you're grounded in is this notion of a kind of workmanship of risk, right? That 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 is the space that exploration and experimentation have a kind of vitality to it uh, that you're interested in. Yeah, definitely, and and it's a real contrast from a classroom teaching which i did for eight years uh where you know all the way down the line uh from administrators to teachers to students um it it, it really does need to be pretty defined and uh the the challenge that teachers have is this motivation how how do i get my kids motivated i mean that that's always the puzzle 
in a place like when we re, we can refer back to the video that that uh, kid Kai from across the street who still comes in here. He's he's now a, a teenager, um, but he uh, when I when I saw this burning desire to make a guitar, and and I thought back to to teaching. Um, this is this is the guitar that's the replica of Paul McCartney's. Guitar, yeah, right? yeah. So he yeah. made a he made a not. It didn't work. It didn't play. It didn't have strings, but it looked exactly like Paul McCartney's guitar. He has since grad. He's graduated to this one, which doesn't look like Paul McCartney's garage uh, gu um, guitar, but it but it does play. You plug it into an amp, and he can play chords on it. Um, but I guess what, what the point I'm trying to make is that is that as a teacher. If you have that burning desire in your student, that's the thing you've wanted, you know, the whole time. So to to have an environment where you can cultivate that and you can go off script um, is is really just exciting. And and there's no there's it, you know we need more places like this for that to happen because right now, um, you know, when you have a student whose interest is sparked in school. Um, you know, a couple weeks later, we might go into a different unit and now you sparked the interest and then went on to the next chapter. So it, it's interesting to me because I work in I work in writing and you work in science and I'm hopefully we have a mathematician out in the in the audience. It's in some place, but we teach subjects that are by their nature or by their institutionalization intimidating. They're scary. There's a kind of fear factor, you know. Whenever I tell somebody I'm a writing professor, they say, "Oh," and then they have this confession to tell me that writing has always been their worst subject, or they have this kind of fear factor in and around that particular subject matter. How do you break through that kind of position that that students might have that science is this sort of intimidating thing done by experts or specialists out in the world and not for them or with them? You know this idea that science is happening everywhere and is is a kind of um, not only inclusive but interactive kind of dynamic process that is continually surrounding us. So how do you? I guess the first part of the question is what do you do with that fear factor? Because I feel like adults might condition themselves to those fears of subjects or things. Oh, I don't do this or I don't do that. I wonder how you deal with that or those impasses that students might bring with to this pro to the space. Yeah, I think well, being inviting uh, with the physics bus as a, as an example here, um, that that was sort of first and foremost in in our mind when we designed it. Um, and part of inviting, uh, we thought, was accessible and familiar. So the whole bus, if you notice, is wrapped in aluminum foil, um, and. Uh, it's actually a turnoff to uh, to some adults uh, uh, that were up on campus, you know, who ride around my neighborhood. Like, what did you do to this perfectly good bus? Um, but but with kids, I think it's it's a great way to do things because they could go home and do their bicycle that way if they felt like it. Um, once you come aboard the stuff you find is uh is you know hair blow dryer a pencil sharpener these are familiar items that they can too take ownership of if they want to go home and get their hair blow dryer and a ping pong ball and float something in the air um, and i think that's one of the things that uh that in some in some stem programs uh you you have a hard time again um, with this, what exists, this difference in the after school informal world and the academic world. And, uh, and so I think some of the ways is to that we blend those together is to use familiar materials. Um, everything isn't all um, uh, locked up in cabinets and such. Um, so it's everything is, you know, visible, like you can see a lot of our containers are clear for that reason. Um, you know, I, I need a ball. Oh, look, there's one. You reach up and you grab it. So, um, so it's, that's part of how we make it inviting. So, 
but writing yeah writing is i will i will confess that that one is a is a puzzle for me <laughs> that one is a, is one that i aspire to become better at but uh but uh haven't been i guess in the right conditions or didn't take the opportunity well i'm glad i got that confession out of you <laughs> that feels good but you you brought up stuff and this is one of the questions that I pose to the audience, um, and, and maybe we'll, we'll spend about five more minutes in our chat or just a few more minutes uh, before we take questions from the crowd. But I'm curious about this notion of stuff that kind of occupies our world. Um, it's mm -hmm. something that I talk about with my family. Uh, my partner is very good about saying, we've got too much stuff. What stuff are we getting rid of? If we accept something new, um, how are we getting rid of the old? I wonder if you could talk a little bit about kind of the principles and philosophies about reusing stuff, because these science experiments really exhibits and demos that students develop, that you develop, um, have a real complex history in that they're, they're usually made from stuff that is quote unquote junk, right? Pencil sharpeners or blow dryers, things that have been discarded. So I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the kind of the, the, the resuscitation of junk and how that fits in with a, within the puzzles of, of what you do with experiential and exploratory education. Yeah, so one part of the equation is that, uh, is that we have a lot of it. I think, I think a lot of us, uh, you know, have to get rid of stuff because uh, in parts, sometimes it's because it breaks. Um, and, and, and I think that, you know, as, if you go back to, I, I know that there are a lot of manufacturers now that are thinking of the circularity piece and let's not just create a, a one directional flow from the, you know, assembly line to the, to the landfill. Um, so, so part of it is to own that stuff, uh, to, to decide, you know, if something breaks that you're not going to allow that to defeat you, you'll either, You'll either learn about it and fix it, or you'll create something new with it. In our case, you can get creative with this stuff. Um, you could even um, take it apart for its component pieces, and you know maybe you're going to collect some motors or you know whatever it is. Um, this sort of activity uh, not only builds a relationship with the stuff, which I feel. Uh, you know, not only gives a sense of agency in the world, it can be very liberating uh, to understand things at this level. Um, you don't feel like you're going to be, you know, defeated when your, you know, toaster doesn't work. Um, I, you know, I venture to say, though I can't, I, I'm not a psychologist, but I, I even think uh, it's therapeutic enough for me that I think that this engagement with physical stuff, um, maybe evolutionarily, um, ha keeps us away from depression at some level. Um, I, I don't have a whole lot of research to to show you, but um, but it, it it makes sense. Um, inter interacting with the physical world. I mean, we find ourselves we find ourselves uh, especially now in the past year, um, the the world more and more has become. Uh, what we see through this two-dimensional screen, um, and I do worry that you know that we that we need opportunities to engage that it's that it's stimulating parts of our brain and the uh, the motor skills and such that are involved um, uh, is is really good for us and it's good for the environment too. So yeah, it's a, it's a creative medium like anything else, I would say. Yeah, and I think you're speaking to something that I hope I hope the audience and, and we'll take your questions in just a second, um, that there's this notion of kind of catharsis that happens when we fix our toaster and we didn't just throw the toaster out, we, we repaired it or we gave that toaster a new life because it now serves as, I don't know, a mailbox or something like that, right? It becomes something outside of itself or a recreation of itself. Um, and I think that is a nice way of thinking about the sort of second life of objects, which oftentimes we think their second life is their last life and it's in some you know, landfill at the bottom of uh, some hole. 
But if we kind of can pull those principles out of ourselves to say, no, 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 this is recoverable or, or fixable or, or can be repurposed for something else, it, it really does make us happy, I think. I think at a, at a, on a real palpable level, we derive happiness from making use of something that was not useful or appeared not useful. And it even, the toast even tastes better. <laughs> I, I know it does, right? If you fix your refrigerator, your washer, your dryer, suddenly it does everything better, right? So Eric, are you ready to turn things over to some of the folks in the audience here? I wanna just read off the questions in case they, for some reason, are not in front of their chat. Um, and Alexis, feel free to jump in here whenever you like. Um, our first question was how can kids, parents, teachers, grandparents, artists, and scientists help others to explore DIY science or craft? Uh, why, is this an is, why is this important to pass on or pass these traditions on? So that's the first question, which is really two questions. Uh, the second one, which we're beginning to kind of uh, futz with a little bit, is what have you repaired or taken apart in the name of art or in the name of science or in the name of good old fashioned fun? Um, and the last one is how can we explore, re repair, repurpose our stuff uh, when everything tells us to buy more or buy newer? So these are a couple of questions, but you may have questions for Eric or myself uh, in and around uh, DIY science, the free science workshop, the physics bus, or, or concepts like craft um, that may be part of uh, something that you've inherited from a parent or a grandparent. Um, and are kind of taking forward. So we'd love to see your questions either in the chat, or as Alexis said, you can raise your hand if you have a question, uh, comment, or something you want to tell us about. Uh, let's see. I see a hand raised. All right, it looks like, John. how do we let- Hey, Ben, you... this is John Hello. King. Hello. Hey, hey, John King. You? Good. Hey, I'm sitting here with Jack, your nephew. Oh, mm -hmm. wonderful. <laughs> yeah, we, we like the talk and just a couple, a couple of thoughts. Um, one thing was, I was glad beyond the, beyond the point about trying to make sure we're not throwing out things un unnecessarily. I, I liked Eric's point about, um, starting to understand how things work, kind of giving you that sense of agency in the world. And, and that's something we've been looking at, like, like here Jack was asking about why are race car engines faster than uh, a normal car engine? And so we're learning about four stroke engines and what that means. And so kind of uh, whether you're a kid or an adult, kind of demystifying the world around you, feel, you know, feeling like you're more a part of it, you understand what's going on around you. Um, so I think that that's a really important point. And then um, the other thing was a, a, lot of the, a lot of the talk about keeping kids engaged and interested by giving them hands-on experience. I think that's, um, that's really, uh, it, it is a good point. I think a, another thing though is emphasizing the, the part of education that comes through that, that even if you're more academically inclined, um, that what you can learn by being hands-on, um, the intuition you can gain is, uh, is something I think is hard to come by when you're just in the classroom, regardless of your, your level of intellect. Um, that's what I found. I, I'm an electrical engineer working on, uh, still working in an engineering company. So um, I think that that is another emphasis. Uh, I wonder if if, if at the, in Eric's work, if you make that emphasis that it's, it's not just about trying to attract kids who aren't maybe excited by school, but it's really, it can be an important part of education for anybody. Yeah, I mean, I, for me, it's, um, it's the difference between learning a language in a classroom and being in a different country and, and speaking it. You, um, I think when you're, when you're in it with your hands and you're building things, you develop fluency and intuition like you like you might not if if you had only experienced it um, through a, a computer model or a textbook or problem sets. Right. Yep. Okay. Well, yeah. Thanks for the talk. 
Yeah, I really like um, your point, John, about the notion of demystification and how that demystification in some ways um, is sort of assuaged or, or um, done away with through the notion of a hands-on. Um, so this notion of once we get our hands on something or get something apart, um, that it no longer, no longer becomes this mystifying principle, like suddenly, you know, a, a two-stroke or four-stroke engine is not just a myste uh, mystery beyond our control. It suddenly, it is what Eric was saying. It has, it gives us some agency, not only to know it, um, you know, I'm reading this book by Keller Easterling, who talks about this distinction between knowing that and knowing how, this idea that knowing how involves this interactive processes versus that knowing that, which is this notion that I know something, but I only know it in the kind of like, I don't know, textbook sense or something like that. Thanks yeah. for that question. Yeah, yeah, thank you guys. All right, and I think we have another one. Uh, looks like Robert Schuler. Hello, Ben, Eric. How are you, gentlemen, today? Very good. I had thanks. an interesting conversation this morning with a neighbor of mine who is a physician, and uh, he was talking about interns, which to me is a little bit about what we're talking about here, this hands-on opportunity. And his point was that as an intern, <clears throat> excuse me, that as an intern, you come in with a significant amount of book knowledge um, and not a lot of that intuition or sense of how, how you were supposed to do your job. But that book knowledge um, leads to a sense of then, and the youth, if you will, or inexperience, leads to a sense of creativity because they're not anxious about what might happen. They're more sort of stimulated about how can I do something different? And then as you age as a physician, for example, then he gains more intuition and he found himself becoming more and more, not reluctant, but, but thoughtful in making those decisions. So I'm curious, Eric, as, as these children go through this experiential activity, do you see a loss of creativity as they become more intuitive and start beginning to understand perhaps what are, some of the risks might be? Um, when you say risk, are you talking about safety or are you talking about breaking something or both? Um, no, I guess I'm talking about outcomes. Let me put it that way. So in the past, when I took this ball and this something, then, then they stuck together and I couldn't get them apart. Does that lead, lead to more or less creativity? In other words, it, it leads to more knowledge, certainly. But does it stifle, do you find any stifling of creativity as they become more intuitive? I would say not at least in this environment. And now, and I've also now been in both worlds, uh, eight years teaching uh, physical science and physics in middle and high school, and now a little over 12 years in this informal environment. Um, and I would say, if anything, I see the opposite that that here in this environment um, there seems to be it just uh, gets to be more and more craving building wackier bigger better things um, what I found in the more academic world um, and this might be physics lab experiments um, or even after school robotics clubs is that uh, is that the, the those are scripted enough um, because th there's you know uh, expected outcomes in those cases that I find that I that I find when those kids then come into an environment like this they they're a little bit uh, nervous I would hmm. say um, it even happened at the level we did a workshop with engineers in Puerto Rico as part of the synchrotron outreach program. And we had done, you know, hooking motors, little small hobby motors and batteries up to wacky pieces of, um, you know, making hopping objects. Um, and this crew of engineers were the least engaged in that activity than any group we had done before, all the way from third grade through high school, through undergrad. 
Um, so, so again, I think there needs to be more uh, crisscrossing that boundary um, more frequently so that we can get both camps to see yeah. the, the place in between, if that makes right. sense. May I ask a follow-up question, Ben? Go, go for it. Um, it's, it's a separate, uh, uh, my question is this, as you, as you hold on to stuff um, in order to, to repurpose it, how do you deal with that inherent conflict of where am I going to store it? And I'm not talking about just in your garage. I'm talking about on a, on a national basis for, you know, if we were going to encourage repurposing, where do we physically put all this stuff to be able to hold it long enough to see what its new purpose might be? Well, can you, I? You, can, yeah, you should answer that. But I was just going to say he, he needs a bigger garage. That was like yeah, one, one, one storage no. space, bigger garage. Are yeah. you familiar, with, are you familiar so, with my garage? What do you know? <laughs> so the, the model that Free Science is based off of, Free Science Workshop, um, it, it started in 1990 uh, in a guy's garage in San Francisco. His name is Dan Sudrin. Um, and it, it's evolved. There's six operating in California. Um, one of them in Watsonville, the Watsonville Environmental Science Workshop, has a relationship with the um, with the solid waste management plant uh, such that uh, there is free flow between the two places. So, mm. um, so they actively, they will take a, a truck there, gather up some goodies, things that they know the kids will enjoy. I call it digesting. Uh, I see it like compost uh, that the kids will go at this like worms to dirt and, uh, and bust it into all its component pieces. Um, and then the, the stuff that they then uh, don't want goes back to the dump. Um, in the big picture, though, uh, you know, to, to try to create one of these in every community would be lovely. I would love to see that happen. Um, you know, it's, we're a long way away from that. Um, but the, in the other, the other side of things, I do see more manufacturers that are creating things uh, that are intended to be repurposed. So, I mean, I, I think, I, I mean, I'm old enough that I remember record players that when you open them up, you know, you find the schematic inside. Um, and I think we do in some ways have to get back to that, that fix it yourself mentality, but it's going to take both sides of that equation to come together into one mission vision. That's that. That's how I was going to answer the question uh, along the same. Well, not exactly, of course, Eric, but I was going to say something along the lines of that. I think it starts with the sort of supply of things and how they're made. When we make stuff that's meant to be broken or is you know, going to break soon, we're kind of setting up this paradigm that is not really sustainable. Right. If we if we build stuff, design stuff and then, you know, execute it and, and, and sell it, it and it's just meant to fall apart in a year or two, then then it's really not a sustainable model. So we do have to get more bigger garages to sustain that. But if on the supply side, like you're saying, if if more manufacturers could get in line with that, I want to get there's a two questions in the chat that I want to make sure we get to. Um, one is excellent, and I'll read that one first. My kids love to experiment with whatever I let them use in the house or outside. They often have questions of why things explode, why they float, why they turn colors, etc. I don't remember even basic science from my school days. Are there some good websites? This is a good question for you, and I'm, I have a feeling you might answer this a slightly different way. Are there some good websites or places to go to find answers or ask questions that will explain these basic principles to them in a kid-friendly way? So if you're looking for explanations, um, I think the Exploratorium, they have a very robust website. I haven't looked there recently, um, but, but that would be a good place. Do you want do you want to tell them what the Exploratorium is so they know what that uh, is? Oh yeah, yeah. So the um, the Exploratorium is actually um, it is a flagship science center. I think a lot of science centers look to the Exploratorium um, as you know a, a model of of what 
um, of what a science center ought to be. It's, it's huge. It's in San Francisco on one of the piers now. Um, it was started by um, by Frank Oppenheimer, the, bro the brother of the more famous Robert Oppenheimer. Um, and uh, it's, they just, uh, they check all the boxes all the way up, up. They do teacher training. They do, um, you know, they have lots of robust explanations online, um, tinkering uh, tricks and stuff. So that would be a good resource. I have another question that may be a follow-up and, and, and maybe one that um, will get us thinking. It looks like you put the Exploratorium resource on the chat there. Thank you, Eric. So as a, this is another question or at least an observation and maybe we'll see what you think about this, Eric. I think this will be in line with your thinking. As a former teacher and present grandparent, I feel it's important to bring children out in nature. We take a wonder walk and look at items in nature that suddenly they notice and wonder about. I have found the key is to stand back and let the child observe and question instead of teach them about a specific concept. So do you want to speak to that? I think that's a really nice kind of analogous point around the natural world. And one of the things I found in, in interviewing 25 artists from woodworkers to fine artists to um, found object artists like Eric they all say that nature is a, a, a place of inspiration and wonder for them. So all of them, that is the most consistent thing you'll find among artists is at some point nature comes into play um, and is part of their thinking. So I wondered if you could speak to the point um, that this lovely former teacher has. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so I think one of the pieces that nature brings to the equation is the adventure piece um, that you that there's going to be unexpected things happening in nature that is not curated um, the discovery piece I think especially if someone's not there to curate for them um, they get to own these discoveries they get to notice things on their own and this is if, if there's anything that makes somebody feel alive it is discovering something that, you know, noticing things about the world. Um, and, and regarding the, um, the, the standing back and allowing the, uh, the kid, the child observe and question, um, I think is, is huge. I think that's really uh, a valuable way to do it. It, it again, it kind of gives them, it gives them ownership of that experience. Um, and yeah. But do you ever have the anxiety as an educator that there should be a lesson learned and it should be packaged or explained in some way? So, you know, um, whatever, you know, the leaf blower and the beach ball and the Bernelli principle, do I have that right, by the way? Bernoulli, they Bernoulli. call it the Bernoulli, yeah, yeah. Bernoulli principle, like, do you feel like, you know, as the kid has got the leaf blower and he's got the beach ball in the air and it's sort of like floating above him and you're like, actually, I feel like you really need to know that that is the Bernoulli principle in play. And and tell me a little bit about what, you know, because I think the, the comment here is about the notion of wonderment and how that can happen and is observable. Do you have any anxieties? Teachers have anxieties about the lesson learned or the objective of the assignment, et cetera. So I wonder if you ever bump into that or how you manage that anxiety. Yeah, I, I think, so I don't have that anxiety. I think <laughs> when, when someone, a, a when a student directly asks me, then it is like this little, you know, gold little nugget that I, I will then seize upon the, the teachable moment, they will call that. But, um, but there is, I don't know the author's name. I do know that she is a Cornell scientist, I believe early child psychology, but I, the way that uh, the novel toy is probably the best way to search it um, here, but she did an experiment that um, I think it was based at the, um, the Boston Science Museum and essentially, if I understand, if I can summarize, it's uh, a bunch of exhibits uh, and, and some of them had, uh, I think 
words along with them. Others had actual facilitators that would say, oh, push this button and look at this mm -hmm. and whatever. What they found from that study was that the less words, the less someone facilitated, the more that kids would interact with this, whatever it was. So I actually worry that, uh, that in a very real way, <clears throat> by naming things, by explaining things, we're, we're taking away some of the wonder that would otherwise an exi exist. And, and while we might get that one nugget now planted in their little brains that, you know, this bird is called a whatever and it eats those berries, what we might be, <laughs> what we might be missing out on. I, I, you're giving us a bridge into next month, right? Mark Mar yeah. Deutschlander will be able to talk oh. about cedar, wa yeah. cedar wax wings and juniper berries, maybe. That's right. That's yeah. right. But I guess, yeah, while we get these little nuggets in lodged in their little brains, uh, these facts, whatever, uh, what we what we might be um, taking away from them is the is this sense of, of curiosity and wonder that, you know, might carry them much, much, much further into their adulthood if if they can keep it up. Lovely. Um, Alexis, do we have time for one more question in case we want to volley one more or are we all sure. set here? Sure, it looks like we have one more question. Oh, let me see. Uh, looks like Mark is there. Hi, can you all guys right. hear me? Yeah, go ahead, Mark. All right, I, thanks. I, I won't uh, take offense to see your waxing comment. Uh, <laughs> although, you know, and, uh, I, I've been thinking about this, uh, a whole bunch of things during your talk from my hobby as a guitarist to how I teach students about birds and the how science tech, uh, technology evolves and, and pushes like biologists to do new things. Um, just to comment on like the naming thing, I think, you know, with, the, with, with learning a few things and then uh, people get more interested in other things, you know, it's a, when they start, for example, with birds and people start looking around and seeing that there are different types of birds in their backyard that they never paid attention mm -hmm. to, then they, they ha there's like a desire to want to know more of those, um, at least in some students. Uh, but one yes. of the comments I wanted to make, um, and sort of relate to something I'll talk about next month, um, uh, is this, your question was, uh, what have you repaired or taken apart in the name of art or in the name of science? And this isn't my story, but a friend of mine who is from Rochester, New York, his name is Mike Lanzone. He now runs a company in Cape May, New Jersey called Cellular Tracking Technologies. But he basically started taking apart cell phones because his wife, uh, Trish Miller, wanted to track golden eagles um, and oh. their movements in the, along the eastern uh, half of the United States. Uh, and there was no device that could answer the questions that she wanted to do. And, and Mike started to realize, well, cellular technology, communicating with cell towers might be a way to get information. Um, but nobody had developed that. So he spent a good part of his life ripping apart cell phones on his kitchen table. Um, and then once he figured out how those things worked and he had an idea, he spent another good part of his life trying to find somebody in the cellular world who was interested in tracking wildlife or, or in helping him develop products that could track wildlife. Um, so he's a really persistent guy. He figured out the tech. He found, he found one person who was interested from the cellular world uh, and now he has a company. And, and now this company is really pushing um, research in how we track migratory birds and other organisms um, forward. In fact, I'm buying some of their equipment to set up at the college's field site um, this summer. Uh, so yeah, I think I, one good part about sort of this discovery, the, a lot of things that you've been talking about is the, the creativity and the, and the sense of discovery that leads to, you know, new advances and really it's entrepreneurial in, in its effects. So thanks. It was a great talk, guys. Yeah, thank you. I That's wanted fine. to qualify the, you know, the, this idea of uh, just quick about, um, you know, offering those. I, I really do appreciate that idea of like, in many ways, we can sometimes 
direct someone's attention where it might not have gone and to notice something and to be able to name it and, and feel a part of that field. I think it takes, uh, it takes, uh, it's harder to do in a, in a classroom setting with, with 30 kids where it feels very one directional, but, um, but in a, where you're getting to know somebody and really appreciating their own curiosity and, you know, that's, that sweet spot there is, is a real um, wonderful place to be. I think Mark's example is a good, a good vote for taking stuff apart, right? And in order to find out how it might match with something you want to do, right? And that seems like such a, you know, two disparate things, thinking about tracking eagles and then getting all the way over um, to the cellular technology. I, want, I think we're at our ending point. It seems fair. Um, Alexis must have other things to do with her life, certainly. Um, as the adult service librarian, I want to thank you for setting this up for everyone here. Um, I want to thank Eric Herman, uh, my co-collaborator. Um, I also want to thank again Mark Deutschlander, who you just got us a uh, chance to meet there um, at the end. Um, and we will hope, and I, I hope this hope comes true, that the physics bus can drive up to the Wood Library in Canandaigua uh, someday. And I'd also, and I've been keeping this wish, wish since 2013 or so, of uh, bringing the physics bus up to um, to Hobart and William Smith Colleges, because I think that would be a great uh, opportunity um, to get uh, kids who are interested in sciences uh, involved. So if you have any questions, you can reach out to Eric or myself. Um, and uh, this is a recorded session that you'll some, you may see on YouTube at some time down the road. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, well, th thank you, everybody. Thank you, Alexis. Thanks, Ben. Thank you. All right. Take Bye. care, everybody. Thanks for coming.